journey that will open your eyes and push the boundaries of your imagination. Ghostly figures, beasts of dark horror, aliens and timeless legends. This is Haunted Devon on Sound Art Radio 102. And you're listening to Haunted Devon on Sound Art 102.5 FM. On tonight's show, we'd like to welcome back Sue Mins into the studio. And we'll be talking about some uh, deep memory process and the College of Psycho... Um, sorry, yeah, it's Monday! <laughs> the College of Psychic Study and so much more after this. So stay tuned. That was uh, ELO and Secret Messages. Good evening, and you're listening to Haunted Devon on Sound Art 102.5 FM. I am very happy to say that Martin is in the studio with us uh, this week. He hasn't broken down. <laughs> I've made it. I'm so thankful I've made it here in one piece. <laughs> oh, you had a bit of an ordeal, didn't nightmare. you, last week? Yeah. I actually had the guest in my car. I was bringing her up because she lives in Plymouth, uh, Laura Quigley. Absolute nightmare. We broke down on the dual carriageway coming up. Um, thankfully, Laura recognised where the foot was. There was a pipe that was disconnected from the radiator. Oh my We word. managed to get that back together using masking tape, but we managed to get to the big Tesco car park and it just sort of conked out again. Thankfully, AA came to the rescue and, um, well. Good old crossed. AA, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, luckily, it didn't need too much repair and yes. it, it wasn't a head gasket jobby, which we were scared of, I yes. must admit. <laughs> Unfortunately, you did have more car problems later in the week, but those have been sorted as well. They have, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so we're hoping that's it now for. Oh, yes, because <laughs> yes. I actually had a parking fine as well for overparking in Toys R Us car park in Plymouth. Ah, so there's last your three. Week, so I have yep. had my three. That's the three. <laughs> that's all right then. Uh, now, before we get on with tonight's show, I have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first, because I didn't get to do it last week, I'd like to congratulate Kelly Walsh on the uh, birth of a beautiful baby girl. Yes, fantastic news. Absolutely. Absolutely brilliant, and we look forward to seeing you soon, Kelly, and also having a little, a little hug the baby. <laughs> They're so cute at that age. Uh, also, the AGM uh, is this Friday. The committee members have um, been chosen now, so we'd like to say congratulations uh, to all those that got onto the committee, and uh, we'll find out what's going on uh, next Monday from the AGM, won't we? Yes, so next. Well, yes, we'll do updates on the show, but well done to you, Abby, because you are now on the committee. Uh, for my sins. The news coordinator. For well my done. sins. <laughs> <laughs> it should be fun. But yeah, I've got a, a long list of, of venues I want to put to uh, everybody on Friday. And also I want to get some feedback as as well of, of the places where Haunted Devon would, would like to go. So mm. oh, yeah, there's plenty of venues out there that there we is haven't plenty. yet explored. Do you know, there's so many local ones that we've not been to. There is. There is lot. so I mean, many. It'd be fantastic if we could get some National Trust properties and English heritage. That would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, not too much pressure there, Martin. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm deafening myself. <laughs> um, with tonight's show, I would like to uh, welcome back uh, a very, very uh, wonderful guest, Sue Mins, who uh, came on our show ooh, last last summer, wasn't it? Yeah, last summer, to talk about the wonders of ancient Egypt. Um, Sue is an interfaith, an interfaith minister, a transpersonal and deep memory process therapist, shamic practitioner, author workshop leader and a guide to the sacred sites of the deserts of Egypt. So I'd like to say welcome back, Sue. Thank you very much, Abby, and thank you, Martin, for inviting me back. Oh, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> now, as I say, last time when, when you came on, we went um, we did a broad overview of um, ancient Egypt and, and the true ancient Egypt and not what's portrayed in, in the history books. Um, at the minute, Egypt is going through a, a bit of a rough time at the minute. I mean, we're hoping to get out there in November. Fingers, toes, legs, arms, eyes, everything's crossed. Um, but at the minute, the political situation seems to have... Uh, yeah, one for want of a better word. So um, well, It's gone into chaos at the moment. I'm just hoping that 
it's it was, would still be perfectly safe to go as long as you didn't go into Tahrir Square, obviously. Mm. But the advantage of going when the place is in chaos, of course, is that everywhere has been empty. So all the sacred sites have just recovered their equilibrium. And there's peace and quiet because there's no visitors, there's no tourists. So it, it, it's kind of got its balance yes, back. If it's yeah. settled down by November, I certainly think it's worth chancing it. I, I, if it's a bit more settled. Than yeah, that, definitely. I'm, I'm right there with you. I've been waiting and hoping yes, and I praying and because well, <laughs> you were meant to be going last october wouldn't you but obviously because of the chaos That's situation it, yeah. over there you've had to obviously postpone it i think it was um well we would have still uh, have gone but i think it was putting people off to be honest with you where as i said the, the provision provisions you've made within the trip itself it would have been perfectly safe and 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 good to do so but unfortunately uh, we do live in an age of fear don't we Yes, well, if we can't get to Egypt, maybe you'd like to come to Easter Island, which is planned for March next year. Now, that is the most extraordinary place I've ever been to. Quite extraordinary. Wow. Who were those people? What was going on there? And when you get there, it's just, it's just stunning in its mystery. I mean, because the history books, they just, they just uh, paint it as people built some statues, they cut down all their trees, so therefore their ecosystem died, so they moved. Uh, that that is how the history the books Easter paint history mystery books. is one of the first sort of mysteries that really grabbed my attention as a kid as well as ghosts and ufos mm. and just seeing those huge statues how long ago was it that you was over there i went when the harmonic concordance was on there which must be about 2004 and i knew that i had to go back because i had no idea i had a vision about getting there and when i got there i, I was absolutely astonished there are 900 of these Moai. They've all got certain distinguishing features. Um, but I thought they'd all be facing out towards the horizon. But mm. there's 250 of them around the circumference of this triangular island made from three volcanoes. And they are all looking into the centre and they are all looking up. But they've all had their eyes taken out. Mm. So there's only one eye the remains of one eye which is extraordinary it's about nearly two feet wide and it's made from white coral there isn't any coral there and it's got a center and an obsidian in the middle so it's the same deal that when you take you know people people believe that when you take out the eyes of the statues same in Egypt you see it then defaced the eyes have gone which means the soul is lost in eternity mm. But there's something much more potent there. It's a geodetic marker. There's no question about that. But why I'm interested in it now is because of Lemuria. And there seems to be a sense that the Lemurian energy is returning to Earth. So you've got Atlantis versus Lemuria, mm. if you like. So the Atlantean energy is very much the east coast of America. That, uh, you know, they were fairly aggressive, as far as I know, and according to Edgar Casey, which you probably know about, yeah. you know, they lost the plot. But the Lemurians just went into another dimension and they existed in the Pacific. They were pacifists. Mm. So um, they are connected with Hawaii. And if you look at the west coast of America, it tells you exactly how, you know, it's let it all hang out and love everywhere and all the rest of it. But there's something more deeper than that going on, I think, in the Pacific. And uh, Easter Island is key to this. Because in the middle, not in the middle, on, in the, e on the edge of uh, one of the coastlines in Easter Island, is this huge, great, huge, I say it's about three foot in diam diameter stone, which is called the navel of the world. I can't remember what it is in Rapa Nui now. But when you stand there or sit beside it, First of all, the compass that you put anywhere near it goes berserk. But also you have a sense of, as you get close to it, of actually falling into a vortex. Oh, wow. Oh, there's mystery upon mystery there. I can't... It's just extraordinary. I mean, it is on, on, on the world's grid as a convergence oh, yeah. site, uh, as well as Giza, uh, Wiltshire, and, all the, other, and the, all the other ancient Absolutely. sites that are around. Yes. I mean, they, it just goes to show that they, they knew what they were doing when they were building these megalithic sites on these power points across the earth. Yes, but who were they? I mean, they don't, there's nothing, because there was a Birdman cult there as well, mm. which, and no one has yet translated what's called the Rongo Rongo tablets, which is the writing of the Birdman cult. Mm. 
and that was just extraordinary that this but I think it's a, quite a powerful myth I had a vision when I was there that as it got as it degenerated Easter Island the, the people's the culture there degenerated they had this kind of ceremony still where the tribes on the island would take a representative and they'd sit on the cliff of one of these volcanoes they would elect one of the men in their tribe to be the potential bird man so at a certain time of year this representative from the tribes and there's probably about six or seven of them mm. would go down the steep side of the volcano and swim across the shark infested waters to this tiny little outcrop of volcanic rock waves pew, and each of them had this peculiar thing around their head which was like a strap with a little cup in the front mm. and that they waited on this island for the sooty turn to arrive there because they migrate there and, and lay their eggs mm. on this tiny little island the one who got the first egg of the sooty turn put it in his little egg cup bam thing and swam back was the one who was uh, the chosen one for a year so peculiar he had all his body hair shaved off he was taken by a priest and kept in solitary confinement for a whole year with this egg now if you look in the vision that I had about that was there's something to do with something was retrieved from the gods in inverted commas mm. and he was radioactive so he had to be kept in solitary confinement but it was some kind of DNA there was something there's a story behind that story and um, that's where from that viewpoint there that's where the the Moai the statue yeah that now lives in the British Museum came from. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. I mean, if, if Egypt it, it is not at all possible, then I would definitely like to uh, accompany you to Easter Island. It's quite a long way. <laughs> well, the, these is. these things yeah. you have to go through, don't you? It's, it's, it's a bit it's a bit further than Wiltshire, but <laughs> <laughs> we can manage. The nearest land is two thousand miles in any direction. I think <laughs> it's quite well, small. It's well, if <laughs> if you want if you want a feeling of uh, solitude and. In oneness of the, uh, with oh. the world, it, it's the perfect place to be, isn't mm. it? Really. Just quickly, before you go into the next question, yeah, there's sure. a question here for Sue. Do you think um, that there was this shared consciousness all around the globe to construct all these sites? What do you think was going on there thousands of years ago? Yes, there was obviously some common knowledge because of the similarity in the way the construction, certainly in South America, Mesoamerica. Uh, Everywhere, actually, wherever you see megalithic structures, there is there is there's a certain um, keynote that tells you that it was the same intelligent, and also you have the same use of measure. So you have the royal cubit or the megalithic yarn. I don't know much about this because I can't add four and five together hardly. I am the same. But um, yes, they're um, all using pi and the golden mean, and it, it's all the same sacred yes, geometry yes. and and yes. and yeah. yeah. I think. I think what was understood then, and what I don't know what happened, Martin, but there was definitely an inundation which gets kind of wiped out everything. So it's always been a mystery to me how that knowledge was transmitted. So as I've been a complete Egyptophile ever since I could remember, it's there were those enigmatic group called the followers of Horus or the people of the first Zeptepi, the first time. They, it said that they could have been Atlantean survivors. They were anonymous. They didn't leave any any information, but they imparted knowledge to to to, to people. Mm. So, I honestly don't know. Well, it, it must have come from somewhere because, uh, as you said last time, mm. Egypt emerged as a fully functioning culture. Mm. No, 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 no developmental period coming up no, to it. it. We have architect, fully, religion, it everything. It never was as perfect as it was in, in the Saqqara. Yeah. Two and a half thousand, three thousand And it, it went downhill it went down from there. From that. But, but it's, it is, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, when you look at where the sacred sites are, look at L Lebanon, the trilithon there. Is that Lebanon? Yes, it is. I mean, all these places are, we can't get there. No. Look at Baghdad, what happened to the museum when we, all the treasures there. I mean, that's such, that's the whole, where the birth of civilization, as we know it, mm. was this particular root race, I think. Mm. 
as I say, they're, they're doing it now with going into Samaria with Babylon and, and all the rest of it, all these really core cool ancient cultures where we derive our whole Dogon, existence from. Yeah, it, it, it's... Mali, yeah. completely Al-Qaeda, trying to wipe them out. But, I mean, you know, their, their information, as we know, they were in touch with the Syrians. Hmm. I mean, as you say, uh, oh, God, going back I don't know how many years ago with Tibet and all the knowledge mm, that... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Sacred knowledge just goes, just gets wiped it, away. They don't want sacred knowledge to go down to uh, me and you and all the rest of uh, the simple folk. It's got to be kept up there for them. But unfortunately for them, with the uh, new emerging energies and the awakening of our consciousness and our evolution, all this knowledge that has been kept for us for so many centuries now, where we've uh, been put in a G-clamp, as you say in, in your article, is, is now uh, coming back to us. And actually, from that, I would like to take us to your article. <laughs> as, as Flo does a nice plug, really, wasn't it? Now, you wrote an article for the uh, College of Psychic Studies called Welcome to the Evolution. Yes. Um... And, I mean, it is a beautiful seven-page uh, article. I mean, I've, I've read it a few times now. Um, again, it's trying to get it to stick in, because with most information at the minute, it's just, phew, yeah. <laughs> but I think most people are like that at the minute with Absolutely. with the way the energy is going, as we were saying in the car. One day you feel perfectly fine, other days you don't know if you're coming or going. Mm. It is very, very topsy-turvy. But in this uh, in this article, um, you talk about what's happened over our consciousness for the past two thousand years, how we, how we have been kept mm. in a G clamp, how we've been very um, five cents, uh, very uh, the the Twitter and the Facebook uh, brainwaves, you call it, <laughs> which is your functioning brainwaves that also gives you logic and and all the rest of it. We've been kept very much in that in that tunnel. But now as um, we've come into the shift of age, we've gone into the age of Aquarius, we've, we've entered the Milky Way, we've moved from the third to possibly the fifth or the sixth dimension in space that uh, so many things now are being made available to us through consciousness. I think we've been, yes. I mean, if you look at all the calendars, all of them predicted what, what have happened to us. Mm. And the Kali Yuga, the cycle of the Yugas, particularly talk about this, all the symptoms that we're experiencing in in our in our life at the moment, which looks catastrophic and chaotic, and how it feels like a dinosaur when you look at it from this perspective, from the third dimension, that it's it's rumbling towards some cliff edge that and it can't be stopped. How are we going to sort it out? How can we sort it out? It feels like such a weight, but it, that's why. I feel that we were kept in this, in this active, it's brainwave activity mm. versus consciousness because mm. the more activity, the more hurts, the, more, the faster the brain goes, the less likely you are to connect to who you really are. So you're not, we haven't been encouraged to drop down into our own, because the slower the brain goes, the wider the perspective we have on everything. So... We operate in beta, which is something like 30 hertz a second. So it's yatta, 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 chatta, 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 more and more and more, faster, 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 but actually... Pshht. Busy, got to go out, got to get to work, got to mm. get the kids, got to get the chopping, got to do this, got to pay silence. the bills. Don't give me silence. I don't know what to do with silence. Yeah. For heaven's sake, I might meet myself. If, I, if, if it's silent, I'm going to turn on the TV and put Desperate Housewives on. Absolutely. I've got to read something, got to, can't go without my pad, pod, whatever mm. else you've got. Okay. So... But that's, it's, it's, go, it's reaching a tipping point. We can't go any faster. faster. It'll just go, it's like a wave. I, it is, I see it as a wave. It's been described as a wave. Ernest Laszlo describes that, you know, when this wave, which has been travelling underground for God knows how long, suddenly emerges everything that it's been carrying is here. Mm. So it's like everything comes up on the screen. And we have now to use our ability to decide what we want because we've been, We've forgotten how to choose for ourselves what it what it is that we really want. I think. We're we're kind of resigned to the life we're living. So the complete opposite of that is to get away from technology and get out there to experience Mother Nature. Yeah, that's I in mean, a we, nutshell, in a nutshell. Yeah. we we have cut ourselves off. I mean, more and more and more, especially over the last fifty to a hundred years, technology ha has cut us off more than any other period in time in history. I mean. 
But it's more scary, isn't it? Mm. When you think about the way things are going with people going to be microchipped, you know, going along with the David Icke scenario. Mm. In so many years' time, we're all going to be microchipped so that the moment you walk into a ship, uh, sorry, a shop. Ship? <laughs> a ship. <laughs> a shop. I'm getting to Abbey tonight. Boy. The moment we walk into a shop, our credit will be automatically downloaded into a cash till, if you will. But of course, there will be no cash till. No, it will automatically be, be downloaded well. directly into the bank account. The, the trouble, so, the yeah. trouble with that again, going back to uh, the, the brain frequencies, and that, especially with things like the microchip and also harp technology, they can keep us at this beta wavelength instead of letting us explore uh, and go deeper into our consciousness. Well, it's constructed to do that, isn't it? Rather well, yeah. like the pharmaceuticals are it's all geared to keep you on repeat prescriptions mm. it's, it's just about just below functional so the, the more we feed everybody the more they're additive everything the less they're going to the ask spartan, and then we'll Nord. put a dose of fear in bankruptcy mm. starvation all the rest of it it's it's so obvious once you start to see what's going on. I mean, you do talk about in the last 50 years how many people ha have woken up to the mm. world around them, let alone the spiritual aspect of things. Mm. And that is very, very prevalent now. I mean, I, I attended the David Icke uh, lecture back in November and it was supposed to be for 5,500 people. He then sold the, the tickets around the stage for another 500. So over 6,000 people ended up being there. And it was a phenomenal day. My brain was adequately, adequately melted by the end of it. Amazing. But it, it was absolutely amazing. And it just goes to show, what, 20 years ago, people were laughing him off Terry Wogan. And now he's selling out Wembley Arena. Mm. So it, it just yeah. goes to show how many people are, are actually waking up to the... Well, there is only one truth, but they're waking up to their own inner truth and seeing what is wrong and feeling what is wrong with their own eyes, and then own eyes, that's it. and then just literally just saying, "Well, no more of this. I'm, I'm not. I'm not living by this paradigm." Of course, a lot more credence now given to all the uh, lectures and books that he wrote like 12, 15 years mm. ago, talking about the satanic ritualistic abuse that's going on amongst the hierarchy, and of course now this is all coming out to be. And again, exposed in the media as I mean, actually it, happening in, as a reality. We were talking the other week, Martin, when we had the meeting. Um, we bought in the paper about Jimmy Savile, and uh, they had him in the black, in a black or red robe, saying he was yes. a, he's a Satanist. But then he's just the tip of the iceberg. Yes. He, he's dead. He's a scapegoat. He's a celebrity that's being used, obviously, as a scapegoat. scapegoat. When, of course, like you say, it's literally just the tip of the iceberg. Let's look in this direction while this is going on. There. Yeah, mm. Mm. T -t -t classic misdirection. But yeah, I mean, it's going on in high-ranking societies, corporations, government, you name it, it's going on. It's just that we're not privy or don't need to be privy to that information because we'd just be totally outraged by it and go up against it and bring the house of cards down on top of their head. Well, I think that's it. It's really important to keep... I mean, the five agreements that I'm, I think I mentioned in that Yes, article I have them here. Is, <laughs> ...is about keeping your focus not on that because it's just like as soon as you drop your energy down, you can get completely absorbed. You by just get sucked into yes. it, don't you? Yeah. And all of that, whereas, yes, we know it's happening. It's all part of the wave that's, you know, the flotsam and jetsam is coming out. We have to hold on to the surfboard at a higher level. But... For, for any change to come in, you have to have resistance to create that change. And, and this is what this resistance is. This, all these horrible things that are being done to the world and done to the people in the world mm. is the resistance to bring in this new conscious shift. Yeah. So yeah. it is going <laughs> to play out against them. But yeah, your, your five power grams, there were four. Uh, but uh, uh, You added another one, which is discernment. Yes, yeah. And I think that's absolutely right because there's so much on offer. You really need a decent bullshit detector to tell what is what and what just is not what. <laughs> this is true. Mm. But it's a, the first one is a, don't take anything personally. Yeah. Never take anything to your heart because it will only bring you down and make you feel horrible about yourself when there's no need to be. Well, usually the stuff that comes at you, it's like having a game of ping pong. Somebody says something about you. You can either let the dart go straight throughout the back and there's no game or you catch it and then you've got something going on because mm. it'll usually hit you in the solar plexus mm. and it's always their stuff that's being fired at you anyway so that's it's really difficult isn't it but it if you just think it's not mine it's there yeah let it go i'm not playing this game always so um other people's insecurities that yeah. are reflected on yourself mm -hmm. yeah don't make assumptions yes we're very good at making assumptions we assume 
all we the do. time, and then we respond according to an assumption. We do, and then we think, ah, I shouldn't have done that, but this is the information I had at the time, and I jumped to this conclusion. Instead of taking a couple of seconds, stepping back, looking at the whole situation and going, ah, <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road. Mm. Keep your speech impeccable. Now, this is what I'm going to have to sort out. <laughs> yeah, especially on Monday nights. Yes. Does that go for me spelling as well? It doesn't mean if you say it backwards, that's, that's allowed. It's just the quality of what you're saying. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can trip over my tongue. That's okay. That's then. okay, yeah. I will be forgiven. Do your best. Mm. Uh, to me, that sounds like instead of, oh, if don't you're going to do something, do it well instead give of... Give it your whole give it, Yeah, don't yeah. half hast it. Don't think, oh, I can't be bothered. If, if you can't put your, your whole self into something, mm. there is just no point. Exactly. <laughs> if you don't feel passionate about something, then just don't do it. Mm. Mm. That's actually an interesting one because it's going to be very controversial now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but with some haunted Devon members who have no belief in the supernatural, that have no belief in hauntings, and they have no belief in ghosts, why do they spend so much time and energy going on ghost vigil nights, on going on investigations? Well, you, you could, you could, you could uh, uh, widen that to every sceptic out there who's made it their life's work, such as... Uh, certain parapsychologists and that, that that don't believe in the paranormal but yet they've spent their life dedicated to disproving it and made a lot of money off it at the same time. It just seems like an incredible waste of energy. It does. <laughs> Surely they can put their energies to better things if they have no belief in what it is that they're trying to disprove or... Or is it a fear of believing in itself? Is that what it is? They, they have to take this hardline sceptic it's all BS root because they can't accept the truth of their own consciousness. Well, is it that they're drawn to that because they actually really want, methinks they do protest too much, you could say. Mm. So they're drawn to something that actually they're really, they're doubting Thomas's. They want to poke the finger in the, in the hole to see or no. So they ridicule it. And it's the best way to marginalise something is to ridicule something. But Definitely. Think of Richard Dawkins, I mean, he never stops talking about God, does he really? No. So, you know, there's there's a part of him, there's the paradox, so that he's anti, but actually there's a part of him that wants to to prove it in an I feel. What an arrogant statement. I didn't mean to say that quite like that. But, <coughs> but you know, what you're drawn to, you can be, it, it can express itself in the antithesis of what you're really interested mm. in. It's a polarity. So he's standing on a seesaw at one end, but the other end is total belief and uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, perhaps. So there they are. <laughs> 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 what he needs to do is stand in the middle and say, well, it's neither of these things, it's something else. It's mm -hmm. something in between. Yeah. Well, none of us truly, truly know. We just have inner truths within ourselves, within our own journey, and we find our own path, our own meanings, and we have things brought to us through um, consciousness, through um, experiencing with angelic beings, um, ascended masters and, and, and whatnot, but none of us have a, a definite on, on what is out there. We can't possibly, in this mm. physical state, I don't believe we couldn't, can't even comprehend it in this, in this physical... I don't think you really need to have... I've certainly never had an angelic or an ascended master experience. Absolutely not. Um, so, and I was certainly a doubting Thomas for years, but I know that I was looking... I'm always trying to, I was always trying to prove the existence of something. Mm. And so that, and I also tried to prove that we invented God ourselves. But I can't, even if you just start with the universe and the cosmos and the whole hermetic principle of as above, so below, mm. it's just, how could it possibly not have an intelligence behind it for a start? And that's enough, I think, to start a journey for you to explore mm. and then if you start to drop down into the slower brainwave frequencies perspective widens mm. so it's not all about having proof at the f in the third dimension so much for me but everybody's journey is personal to them isn't it totally personal so you might find it, anyone might find it by being ghostbusters yeah Going to a medium, I started at the spiritual SAGB, whatever it's called. Somebody brought a message, and I thought, well, blimey, where did that come from? And so then you wake up. It, 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 like it, it sparks a so curiosity off in you, doesn't it? It's a yeah. lifelong journey. 
<laughs> with me, I must admit, most mo period. most of my um, I haven't had many since, unfortunately. <laughs> but <laughs> it's because I'm always on the go. I, I don't get a chance to quiet my brain, but I am remedying that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I must admit, most of my um, <laughs> own personal inner realizations came from uh, after coming back from Lupton on a Thursday night, when I just used to sit in my room on my own, very quietly, and ab just absorb what had been done in the course on the gateway that night and the amount of things that came to me and you just you just sit you're not even thinking of anything you're just letting it all sink in and you just and all of a sudden you just get this realization and you just go oh. and it, a lot of things just just click into place and make sense that you'd spend your whole life scratching your head on the mm. mysteries and meanings of mm. i mean being being spiritually oriented doesn't mean to say you you have to be in anything you can no you know, people, or even be profound about anything. Gardeners, p simple, ordinary people who lead simple lives, I think, because they're in tune with something. Mm. They're in tune with something bigger than just themselves. Mm. And nature is a, is a terrific key for this. So, you know, druidic, well, those, those things that involve earth ceremonies, I think, are, are what we need because they earth us, mm. they ground us. And it's not about belief systems again, because we've been there, done that. But it's a way of opening perspective. That's it, yeah. I mean, I don't believe necessarily any... No. Different that. I, have an, I, have, I, have, I have an idea, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's just opening my own... That's enough. Opening my own knowledge it's to... It's like the inner awareness. Is yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the inner awareness that you have. And then you expand from there. And sometimes you think you're going down one path, you go into belief, the, and then you think, no, no, no this no, isn't no. right. And you go down another path, and you think, oh yeah, this seems makes more sense to me. Mm. On your, you know, within your inner self. I mean, I must admit, I don't knock anybody for believing what they believe. Everybody has their right to their own opinion and their and their own belief structure. And and nobody, I don't think, has the right to challenge it. You have a right to challenge it within yourself. But I don't feel that other people can can come into you and go, oh no, no, that's not right. This is right. But um, I must admit, I, I don't agree with any organised religion. Well, I think the Hindus, in my training as an interfaith minister, it was very interesting to have uh, people represented, representing all the different major mm. religions. And the Hindu, if I'm going to be in anything, I might be a Hindu, because he described Hinduism like this. And it's a very good analogy that there's a big circle, let's say, and in the centre is a light, a strong light, and all of us start our journey from the circumference of this circle. So it doesn't matter where you are, so whether you're an Aborigine or whatever you are, you start on the edge of the circle, and whether you like it or not, you're going to be drawn to the centre. Mm. But of course there's scenic routes, there's all sorts of different routes, there's, there's the hard road and the branches, easy road, there's, yep. twigs, there's you name it. But in the end, we are all moving towards that light. Mm. So they don't mind what you believe because everybody's making the same journey mm. ultimately. I know it, it wasn't um, that what I was getting at with organised religion. It's the, it was the control of organised oh, yes. religion I don't like. The, the control over other people, other people's lives. Well, that's what creates wars, isn't it? it? The killing in the name of. It, it, I, I don't agree with any of that, I must admit. Right. We're just going to go to a quick break and uh, we're actually going to play a request from Sue, which is hopefully, if it's all queued up right, <laughs> we can but hope, it should be uh, Sweet Home Alabama. And that was uh, Sweet Home Alabama. But, but can anyone tell me who it was by? I can't believe she's thrown that question out. Yeah, it's only because I don't know, so I thought I'd land you in instead. <laughs> it's a great song. But... It is a great song. No idea. We've just been discussing in the break lots of things and also how hard this song is on Guitar Hero. <laughs> it is impossible. 
Uh, you're listening to uh, Haunted Devon on Sound Art 102.5 FM. Today we've been uh, talking to uh, our guest Sue Mins, who's very graciously come back into the studio for us. We've been uh, talking about the uh, evolution of humankind as well as Easter Island and lots of other to- subjects I can't even begin to even get my head round. Uh, but uh, as we're carrying on, um, as it says on your uh, bio that you are a transpersonal deep memory process therapist. Now, what is a deep memory process therapist involve? Deep memory process is the trademark of uh, the work of a man called Roger Wolger. Roger Wolger was really a, a pioneer in, the, in bringing credibility to past life regression therapy. And he was from the uh, Jungian analyst, yeah, from... He was a Jungian an- analyst, and then things started to happen to him, spontaneous regressions. And so he decided to investigate that, and then he created his own tra- training program. Mm. So he died a couple of years ago. Um, and so th- I did my training with him, and I was very grateful for it, and I f- because it's a really useful tool. I mean, it's something, um, especially reading up on it on your website today, um, it was something I, w- I would like to actually do myself and feel that I'd, I I would need to do. And as someone who knows me, you're probably nodding your head going, yeah, that could probably be beneficial for you. <laughs> well, you have to wait till a clue gives you a poke, a prod. So sometimes people come because they don't know where else to, to go with mm. what's happening to them. And, of course, you know, there's it, it's... It's very helpful with things like irrational fears, phobias about, well, at its very simplistic level, f- fire or water mm. or small spaces or it can be anything, fear of dolls, fear of bald men, fear of you name it, being trapped, all of those things. If you, if you follow the line back, uh, there's a story there. And it's, uh, as um, he put it, it was finding the story behind the story. That's right. Mm. I've been doing research. So, <laughs> I think it's quite, I've come a bit, you know, now I've been a past life regression therapist for so many years. Um, I th- I believe now, in these times, something else is going on, that the body itself carries memory. So, mm. and the memories are held in the DNA and the, and the cellular structure. So, our bodies are actually producing their own karmic uh, symptoms in the form of weird illnesses, fractures, mm. breaks, um, because there's, all, there's a story behind that as well. Strange rashes, viruses, all sorts of things uh, which take you, <coughs> because I think the body carries the memories as well and it, mm. it's, you know, we've done our emotional therapy and now the body's saying, okay, what about me? Because mm. it's saying here the, the body has actually, <coughs> uh, has been forgotten a lot. Yeah. In this yeah. instant, um, it's uh, the reason for doing uh, this work is to revol- resolve conflict and psychological distress, but also to find within ourselves a deep source of renewal, strength, and wisdom. It is not too difficult to get at the skeletons out of the closet with people, but to get at the gold is a different matter. The th- the uh, this therapy is finding the art of uh, getting the gold of the spirit, and that was by Robert Johnson, I believe. Yes, yeah. he was. A- he was a young in <coughs> the point of I mean I think the most important part of a past life regression and it's not always a past life story sometimes people actually go into a different dimension because it's done in an altered state mm. um, and they connect with who they really are I don't know how to put that but they meet someone in a different space because of they're in an altered state mm. um, but the most important part of a past life per se let's say you've had a a life where you were trapped somewhere um, or you were in a battle. Let's say you had a fear of drowning. Now I'll just tell you, shall I give you an anecdote here? Go on. All right, so there was a woman who was absolutely beside herself um, over her phobia of going into the sea. So she'd got two little kids and she would step into the water with them and that was fine, but as soon as she felt her feet were off the ground, she started to go into this catatonic panic. Mm. And it didn't make any sense, and so she thought, oh, well, it's just fear and phobia. (coughs) But then other symptoms started to happen. She started at night. She would wake up and find that there was water coming out of her mouth, so she decided she would 
obviously the doctor couldn't sort this out. Mm. So she came to investigate past life, a past life uh, regression t uh, session. So how you access the memory of this is, so I just asked her, she was sitting there, lying there actually, relax the body, and then I just asked her to go to the memory of the last time she was with her boys in the sea, when suddenly she couldn't, f she couldn't feel the bottom underneath her feet. And as I said, as she said, oh, she started to do that, I said, go to the source of this. And she said, oh, I'm standing on, um, I'm on a big ship and it's night time. And she explained the story that she was on her honeymoon with her beloved mm. fiancé, but they had a bit of a tiff. They were dancing, I think it was in the 1920s, some around that time. So she went up onto deck to get away from him just to take a breath of fresh air and it had rained. And she slipped, her foot slipped on the deck and she shot underneath the railings and went into the dark sea. Mm -hmm. So of course nobody knew where she was. Mm. And her new, new husband came to look for her, couldn't find her anywhere. By that time, of course, she was way in the distance. But as far as her story was concerned, she fell into this, into the water in her gown and started to scream and shout and it was there was a lot of panic and a lot of emotion around that and then she finally drowned so the most important part of that is why would that yes you can see the phobia but there was unfinished business from that life mm. because she left that life thinking he doesn't know what's happened to me he doesn't know how much i love him etc plus the fear that went in precisely so the trigger was in this lifetime the fear of water but actually what the soul wanted to do was to make amends with her husband so it's mm. the interlife state it's what happens after you leave the body that's the the most significant part of a past, past life. life experience because that that's what proves to you that you are eternal mm. a spiritual being in a in a human body it. i mean um as um, your colleague uh, described it, uh, it was saying uh, once people addressed and were actually taken back to the, the, the trauma, um, such like you would do with someone uh, suffering from post-traumatic stress, they make them relive that initial trauma, that it actually it serves its purpose and they're able to, to get on with their lives a after the fact and, and put it behind them. Mm. Well, it's like a frozen part of yourself. Mm. And often, it doesn't happen so much now, but often that happens to us in childhood, that when we come in as a soul, we come in and information comes towards us. We, we're just like little satellite dishes. Mm. We don't filter what's coming towards us. So we don't judge it either. Whatever happens to us, we feel is, is normal. But there are moments when the soul feels a shock. And it can be something as seemingly trivial as being told that Father Christmas doesn't exist. Mm or your mother drops a turkey on the floor and the father said, right, that's it, I'm leaving. <gasps> the child is frozen. Mm. So it's similar. You can put that in a, f in a timeline that goes further back than this lifetime. Those moments freeze something. So if you'd, it's not about recreating the trauma again. And, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, people are traumatized and there are things to do about that. The body also gets traumatized. Mm. But if you go back into that moment as the adult, as the conscious person you are now, and you collect that little child, it's, I can't explain it, it's, a, it's an alchemical process, but it's like as you pick up that child, it's all right. It's like you repatriate energy that you've been missing all this time. Back into yourself, And yeah. I think, you know, most of us carry a kind of, all these little people pulling the strings in the slipstream mm. as we move forward. I mean, how how important are past lives or understanding our past lives to, to us? Some people maybe not. Um, I found it, I found it really helpful, mm. and I didn't believe in them. I have to tell you, when I started doing the training, I resisted the whole thing. I just thought well, we're all making all of this up. Um, but I I know that it works, and you can see because the sim it's like going. You go to a place and you know that you've been there. Mm. You recognise yeah. it. You recognise people. Oh, I you know, you feel as if you've known them forever. It's like the t it's called resonant frequencies. It's mm. like tuning fork. So um, the triggers are all around us all the time. Uh, 
in our behaviours, <coughs> in our relations, everything. Patterns that we repeat. Patterns that we repeat. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, it's really getting to the point where we can see, oh yes, well that you know that all belongs to something, but actually that's not who I am. No. Mm. It, it's there for a reason that has yet to be discovered or uncovered or resolved. Mm. What would you say to the um, sceptics out there that says past life, past life regression nonsense, past life incarnations nonsense? What would you say back to them? Go on. <laughs> I would say, well, well, I think, I think Martin's going after sceptics tonight. That's to fine. I mean, I couldn't care less, but I know that it was I mean, perfect. Yes. The scientific evidence is out there, and I think it's overwhelming that it exists. Exactly. Now, why are some people so pig-headed to say, don't be so stupid, of course there's no such thing as reincarnation? Well, it's rather like ghostbusting, isn't it? Of course <laughs> there's no such thing as ghostbusting. OK, well, find out for yourself. Well, no, they don't. It's like talking to somebody who's in set in concrete there's no point in wasting energy on people who don't want to explore end of story this is very 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 true i mean it's something i learned um again going back to um the gateway course in, in lupton something that made a lot of sense to me and actually helped me come to terms with a lot of things that have happened in my life um is something i can't remember which lesson it was now but it was one of the ones you were uh, teaching us uh, saying that we have chosen this life before we come into it. Everything that happens to us is meant to happen to us in, in order for us to grow and learn. And that is something that resonated with me very profoundly and, was, and I was able to come to terms with a lot of things that have happened in my life because I know I've overcome them and I know I've grown as a person and that that was meant to be. I think when you, yes, where, that's a seminal moment when you suddenly realise, I can remember the moment when it happened to me, that I chose that particular mother and the fact that I had no father. Mm. When I realised that I wasn't a victim of circumstance, that I'd chosen that because of all the, th all of the stuff that it chucked at me, obstacles on the flight path, if you mm. like, um, it was, yes, it's so liberating. I mean, you, you look back and you, you, I mean, you don't regret anything. The good, the bad, the ugly, the boring, <laughs> any of it. You, you, you just look at your life and you think, well, I'm glad everything that's happened to me has happened to me because mm. I am now this person because of it. I think if you stay in that victim mode, I remember a most extraordinary man called Manuel Schock who taught timeline therapy in the 90s and he was adopted no, he wasn't adopted. He went into a, some awful foster home. He was German, I think, and he was actually chained to the chair. It was just mm. the most shocking story. But he, well, he was gifted. He was definitely gifted um, because he could see the woman who used to come towards him with a stick to beat him. He could see her aura. He would dissociate himself from the body that was... Mm. And he could see in her aura that she had a violent husband. So again, then she was taking it out on him because yes. she was getting so it. So he yeah. was an advanced soul. I mean, that, you're lucky if you have that because mm. it means you can see things. But, but I think that once, you know, you could say, well, why would people, why would a soul opt to be sexually abused or all of the horrors that go on? And the answer to that is, I don't know. I can have a guess at why that might be. Mm. Um, but there is, I do believe that karma exists definitely so do as you would be done by and if mm. you you know if you need to understand what it's like to be well the abuser becomes the abused mm. etc so it's what goes around comes, comes around, around. Mm. can i throw in something a little bit controversial again sorry about this <laughs> <It's not> talking <laughs> talking about pre-planned life ahead of you where does uh, free will then come into this? Because I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there saying, oh, hang on a minute, if you're saying that everything is pre-mapped for you, yeah. what is free will all about? That's a very good question. That is a very good question, Martin. Because um, I think free will and choice is the kind of wild card in the whole thing. So I think if we were an experiment, which we might be, and this is a Petri dish in which we all are, then there's no point if there was... Uh, that which created the Petri dish, having a clockwork model doing everything as prescribed, how boring would that be? So chuck in free will and choice. Mm. That's the wild card. So yes, there are. I believe there are certain moments, there are certain appointments that we have through our life. What you do with those, 
So that's the predestination. That's the predestination bit that you turn up for that particular appointment at that particular time. What you do with that then belongs to you. Mm. So you can you've got the choice then of turning yes. left or turning right. Exactly. Like you were yeah. saying about the the Hindu belief system, we are all on this uh, mm. concentric circle, and there's many twists and turns mm. and choices along the way, but we always end up in the same destination. Ultimately. Yeah. Over many many lifetimes. Yes, <laughs> over many 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 <laughs> lifetimes. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <coughs> I can't believe where the time's going. Oh, I know. Time. I mean, I know <laughs> we have, uh, in every life there is trauma. Um, it, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the richest person in the world. You could be the poorest person in the world. You could be the most privileged and you could be the most underprivileged. Nothing. There is always going to be trauma in somebody's life. There, there is no escaping that. And again, um, with lessons to be learned, do you, do you think that some past life... Um, Memory jolts, dreams, uh, visions uh, are there to help you remember something that you've forgotten or to, to guide you on something that is going to happen to you in, in the future you're going through now? I think there are always... I mean, what's the, the conundrum for me, the question now, is why do some people get it? Why are some people born knowing it? Why mm. do some people work all their lives like I have to try and find a truth? And why do some people are never going to get it? Well, that's not to say they're never, but you could say there's a certain level of humanity that really is almost robotic. Let's call it matrix. Again, then you, you've got your, f well, matrix, not free will, but then you've got your free will to, to not be a part of that. But again, that's where that, that could, that could I mean, come in. I mean, what defines that is my burning question. So what defines our intelligence? We've got, a, we've got a way of measuring intelligence. You know, what's your IQ, for example? And I think consciousness works on a scale like mm. that as well so perhaps it's to do with well there are moments that come towards us and we've got the choice to say oh it's a load of rubbish that's why the ghostbusters go on going to try and some something might just knock them off their perches mm. the soul saying okay let's put them in this situation they might just get it no, no. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, that's just a hypothesis, of course. I mean, I can remember from, um, and I'm sure my mother will be nodding away as she's listening now, from the age of, oh, four, five and a half, uh, that era, uh, having this reoccurring dream of, of me dying, but not me as I am now. I was, um, as far as I'm aware, I was a soldier in the, in the Second World War, an American who was a fireman. This is what I've, I've had of reoccurring dreams all my life. And um, I went to Slapton Sands with uh, Graham um, as one of the Dartmoor evenings, and it was yes, it was a Dartmoor <laughs> evening. But you end up in Slapton Sands. Don't ask me. You I knew get more further away no, from Dartmoor. No, I know. I I um I knew where we were going, even though I hadn't been told. I I I said to Graham, I said, I said, we're going to Slapton, aren't we? How do you know that? I, said, I don't know. I just got a feeling. <laughs> and um, it was actually the anniversary of. Um, the disaster that happened there and also the, the, oh, little, yeah, the, World War II the little mini yeah. uh, German invasion that, that, mm. that, that happened there. The boats, yeah. I mean, I always believed that I, I died on, on the Normandy beaches, D-Day. Um, something, when I visited Slapton Sands, I, I can't explain it, I was, walking in two, I was walking in two different time zones at the same time. But just it to was... let our listeners be aware here of what the history is here of Slapton Sands, of yep. course, every soldier basically that fought on the Normandy beaches would have done all their training and practice on Slapton Sands on the south coast of Devon. So that is um, quite something that Tra you've experienced. Traced it back as well, because when I went to Lupton <coughs> I got a bit of a mm there, and I reckon I was actually housed at Lupton before we went over to yeah. Slampton Sands. But the, it was, at, it, I found it very, very traumatic at the time. I was crying. I had to stay behind when the group left because I just needed to just stay there and, and, and be, be in the energy. But it was something that um, I'd always known that I'd drown. I was shot. There was, um, there was a funny voice over a loudspeaker. I was shot and I, and I, was, I went head like face first into the water and that was me um 
the one thing that really, really struck me um, was Graham, we were, we were at the tank, we were at the end, and Graham was explaining everything to us. I was away from the group because I, I just couldn't be near, I just needed to be with them, but not with them, if you know what I mean, as I was trying to process all this that was going on around me, having sensations from 60 years ago and sensations from right now. It was a, a, a dual existence that was, was um, even too much for my little brain to handle, to be honest with you. And he um, he said something about uh, something that they fixed before the uh, the D Day landings was a lot of the soldiers that went into the water um, that night drowned because of their life vests because they were packed full of ammunition and that that's how I went I went head first and I, I couldn't get back round so I'm I'm now wondering okay well did I actually make it to Normandy or or because of this strong physical and emotional reaction. Did I actually go on uh, at uh, Slapton Beach? Many Americans were, of course, and British killed on yeah. Slapton Sands. This was actually kept top secret, and it, I don't think it was leaked out until, I think, the early 1970s. Mm. But from 1944, when it happened, it was certainly well, all they, kept they top secret. Well, they commissioned the whole whole village, didn't they? The whole village was, yeah, was several relocated. Yeah, the yeah. were all had to be relocated out, so all this was done in top secret. The military manoeuvres, the practising, the training mm. on Slapton Sands. Also, there were some German U-boats out to sea that were also firing in on the land as well. Um, as well as of, the, um, uh, the boats that were... A lot of Americans yeah. which did lose their lives in the practice runs, in the lead-up to the Normandy landings. But, uh, that wouldn't be difficult to access. No, because it, it's something that has... Well, I guess I can say haunted me, yeah, because it, I suppose well, it has haunted me mm. for most of my life. It sounds as if it needs to be cleared, and it's quite easy to do that mm. because he needs to be put to rest. But he's active, or the, the essence of that man is always active because it has something to say to you in the here. And yeah, I've, 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 from the age of about four, four to five years old to now. The I've always had that dream. It's not on a nightly basis, but it will be a reoccurring dream that will happen. That's an interesting thing, though. You're saying that he's active. Now, surely we're saying he's active. We're talking about Abby's consciousness, Abby's soul. Some aspect of, some aspect of her. Now, I don't know whether it's her. There's a reason for it. There is always a reason mm. for it, Martin. When something's active, I call it active like that. Because you can walk into a place and it, and there's and the fact that it's repeating itself, it's making itself known to her in some way. Because there's some, there's always a message. Mm. And if this sounds like Madame Alcati, believe me, this is coming from my own experience. That that the essence of that man has got something to say to you in the here and now. Mm. That's the point of it. But he has to speak to you from another level. Another so level. To, to, it's either other, in a dream state or you. You. Yeah. You need. In my view, it's difficult to it's difficult to access these on your own. You need a facilitator. Mm. That's all I am, a facilitator. Well, I'd be definitely uh, so definitely up for re resolving that. Um, only if to forward. stop the dreams of myself dying over yeah. and over again. To be fair, yeah, to yeah but it, it it it's something. I've all, I mean, as a four year old or a five year old, mm. you know it. Know what's it of of the oh, war coming it. coming up to me, mom, and coming up to me now, and going, this is how I died, but. In my in my dream that I had, they were with me, but they weren't. It, it, it was really weird. Well, you've got the dimensions all muddled up. Yeah. There. I mean, coming together, haven't you? Because the veils are so thin. So yeah. Who am I? Am I here or there? Am or I? Whatever. But it's always when I mean a lot of people when they see World War Two films start to weep or whatever. I've had lots of examples of that of little fighter pilots. Yeah. You know, they just see. They can't stop watching World War Two films. It's either to do with the trenches or it's some drama or a book mm. that they I've got to keep on keep reading on. Victorian novels because there's something I recognise about that. It's a sense of, of There's that. a link there, yes. yeah. And there's um I mean I once had a client who'd been to Prague thirty eight times. Thirty eight times I don't know why I keep going back to Prague. Of course it was a huge story waiting there to be waiting to be accessed, yeah. yeah. I mean you can have I mean past lives it's not just you've got one or two going on there you could be going all the way back to you don't have to that's the point. no no i mean but your yes. your soul your yes. consciousness is yes. is is an everlasting yes. being it's a it's never dying absolutely. that can incarnate <laughs> as many times as it wants in as many dimensions that it wants <laughs> it's a, well, as many times as it needs yes before it uh 
complete that concept can frazzle the human brain can't say us speaking here in physical form in our physical bodies mm. to think about life as completely eternal that it does go on forevermore it frazzles your brain although the whole concept of time doesn't actually exist does no, it well, because it, we, we it. move from one dimension to another and then time. back into a physical dimension yes, it, it, as you it. said it's completely quantum you're out of time by reality so it, you don't think about here where gravity held time bound mm. physical out there it's different so as soon as you step into uh, a past life regression session I facilitate that you stepping into that place where you're out of time mm. it, it was strange because around me it was really weird I'd, I'd haunted Devon around me but yet I had all the sight sounds and smells not in my actual vision but also it, like in my mind's eye sort of thing going on around me so it's very difficult to concentrate on what was going on with the group and to try and Mm, sort you must out. have looked completely phased out on that <laughs> <I> did, night. Yes. <laughs> Abby was definitely spaced out on that one. Now, um, with um, Deep Moment Process, Past Life Regression, um, you, as you say, you go out of your body into your consciousness and in, in, into your old self, so to speak, in your mind. Is that the same principle as astral projection? No. It's like uh, fields of information. So we know about morphogenetic fields now, that feel, fields of information exist. And that's your, um, what did you say? Is it what? Is it like uh, astral, astral, projection? astral travel? No, yeah. no, no, that's conscious. That's something completely different. Mm. Um, I was going to say something, it's completely gone. Never mind. <laughs> Happens to me on a daily basis. <laughs> Uh, remote viewing is that, yeah. as, no. is that the same as astral projection? Yes, exactly. yeah. it's similar. Is it a similar just, to cl just yeah. to clarify for the listeners, because yeah. it, it, with all these broad topics, it's very easy to get confused mm. between. Yeah, past life is like going into. Okay, we talk about the akashic records. Yes. So there's memory banks. So there's fields of information. So you're actually going into a website, and mm. I see that past lives are like people's personal websites. That are never so read. So the trigger, yes, and you can. So here's a computer operator, and all the websites are out there somewhere, like TV programs. Mm. You don't have to access them until something bleeds through and actually disturbs your keyboard mm. or comes up on the screen. And you keep thinking, why is that keeping coming coming up? It's a link. It's a link, and then you press the link and you open the field, and there it is. That's not a bad metaphor, I suppose. For past That's, lives. That that is a very good metaphor. Is completely different, yeah, and there's a lot of it about, and I'm very particularly interested in that and near-death experience. So I'm going to Jamaica uh, in a couple of weeks' time and there, where there's a scientific and medical network conference. How could you have a conference in Jamaica? You can't. It'll be on the beach, I expect. But anyway... Well, you're getting back to nature, so that's half the battle. Is, it's about near-death. It's about consciousness, nature, and, well, near-death experience. Mm. So in other words, out-of-body... Conscious out of body experiences. experience, and there's a book that I really like to mention. If anybody's listening, yeah. needs to really read something from from the mouth of a neuroscientist. It's a book that uh, topped the New York best-selling list for I don't know how many weeks, and it's called Proof of Heaven, and it's written by Dr. Eben E B E N Alexander, and it's absolutely groundbreaking because here's a man who was entrenched. In neuroscience, he's a neuroscientific surgeon, whatever you are, and he just thought that all this NDE chat was really brain chemistry. Mm. Now, he then he got um, an E. coli infection, followed by meningitis, and was plugged into a machine for seven or eight days. And his experience of what happened to him is one of the most moving and Yes, it's just extraordinary. Read it. It's mm. really worth it. Look out for that book. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. We'll put, it, we'll put it on our readers list. We, yes. have, we have got a long readers list. We, we have, yeah. <laughs> Ever growing. Yeah. Ever growing. We, the books we read for the show and also for our own, yeah, it's, uh, we, we're often like, when we come to the studio, swapping books exactly, between us. Yeah. I mean, I've got hundreds of paranormal books. I've been reading them 
you know, since a kid, but I'm always forever learning. Yeah. Always. You never stop learning, yeah. I don't yeah. think. Just about the paranormal in itself yes. is so vast so and really you're strange. always learning. Always. Well, as Alex said, uh, um, when on Alex Goins' show on, on Thursday um, to, prom to promote this show and, and also sound art as well, he said with the, uh, the remit that you cover, you can never run out of material. No. Absolutely. It's like you, yeah, you, you could go, you could go on, you could go on forever, and you still wouldn't be finished. Yeah, it's very, it's fractal. It's a fractal universe. So yeah. Yeah, it is definitely a Mandelbrot set. I mean, that's something we'd love to go into for a future show. Is um, frequencies, quantum physics, sacred geometry, sacred geometry, sacred. Yeah. The Mandelbrot that appeared. Oh God, 1991. The crop circle. Fantastic crop circle. Cambridge, just outside of Cambridgeshire in 1991. Yeah. Now, this is one of the few crop circles where even sceptics think, oh, hang on a minute, mm. this is impossible to be man-made, simply because of where the centre points are in the circle. There are several centre points um, around, and it makes it basically impossible to replicate this through human means using their stomping boards with the measurements. You just cannot replicate it. Mm. Well, the Mandelbrot it's set is... Fantastic. is... Um, such an amazing thing because no matter how close you go into the picture it, it it's just the same thing repeating itself for infinity yes. but yet it's contained which is very much what quantum physicists think the universe is they think how can such an infinite object be contained mm. and they didn't discover this for a long time until they factored in pi mm. and that kind of like clicked it all yes. <laughs> clicked it all don't ask me how it works with pi <laughs> i'm not a quantum physicist or a mathematician but we're going to get one on the show we, we are going to get what <laughs> one that's um good for the brain waves and doesn't melt me too much <laughs> would be nice um now before we go this evening martin i do want to get in this uh ufo sighting from cornwall all oh, right yes um we have got the video up on the haunted devon facebook page on last week's show i will get it up again for this week's show yes it's a fascinating piece of footage um, it, it's quite short, it lasts for about two minutes. Um, you see a light. Um, I haven't actually, well, let's scroll down so you can get scroll down to see and, it. and, and get it on. Yeah, here. um, basically, I mean, basically, there's two objects. Um, one, uh, let's see, it was a couple of weeks ago, it was a little bit yeah. further down, isn't it? I think it was on last mm. week's show. There we there go. It is. I'm going to play this out so that Sue can see it, and I'd like to know what your reaction is yeah, to sure. this as we play this out. Um, obviously, we'll do it without sound. I'll talk over it. As, yep. <laughs> well, actually, it's four minutes long, so what I'll do, we'll fast forward to towards the end. Um, now, I passed this footage on to the chairperson of the Cornwall UFO Research Group, uh, Dave Gillam. I've got to say, there's a lot of UFO groups out there that keep very secretive and don't let anything out. But we at Plymouth UFO Research Group and with the Cornwall UFO Research Group, we've got a good um, working relationship. We share mm. a lot of um, footage, a lot of reports. Well, I mean, um, you can't have the day of disclosure if the, if the UFO community is not sharing. Unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of them are keeping things like this. If they came across this piece of film footage, they will keep it to themselves and publicise it themselves without sharing it out as such. Um, I actually came across this piece of film footage and I immediately alerted Dave Gillum to it yeah. because obviously it's the Cornwall UFO Research Group That's and right, he's yeah. based down in Truro. So he's actually set up um, a meeting with the guy who filmed this. Um, at the moment, that meeting is still yet to happen. Um, he's going to tell me more when he's actually mm. done the full interview with the guy who took this footage. So here it is now playing. So I'd like to know what Sue thinks of the footage. Um, now, watching something last night, Martin's going to be very impressed now. That, to me, looks like the uh, ghost rockets. Mm. Yeah. If you remember back to yes. that... Um, right, that is another... Um, I think that's a, a light at the... On the, on the ground, yeah. Right. So that's For it. a reference point, obviously yeah. you've got the trees that's there in the foreground. That is. What on earth is it? Now but it is clearly out of focus. Um, whatever it is, the fil whoever filmed this has filmed it out of focus. Mm. I think basically it was on an I, in, I think it was on an iPhone. It was actually yeah. filmed. If they on. zoomed out, you wouldn't pick up on this detail of what you're seeing because what you're seeing is a top half, which is um, yeah. a darker blue, and the bottom half is a much lighter blue. So it's made up. It's like two sections, one on With top of the other, great, high up in the sky. What are the dark holes in it then? Again, there's like two. Uh, portals, portals, two windows mm. there, and it seems to be hovering because it's in reference to the two trees at the ground level, 
and it's staying in between the two trees much higher up. So it's not moving, it's staying stationary. So was this, um, was this so over Senan or more over the clifftops of More over land, the Land's End land area, yeah. yeah. Um, what I'll do now is move it on the sequence so that Sue so can... It doesn't See, look exactly aerodynamic, does it? It does. This is the classic UFO. Very few UFOs look aerodynamic, yet they can just suspend their midair without making any kind of sound whatsoever. <laughs> That's the magic of UFOs. Ours didn't, definitely didn't look aerodynamic, did it? <laughs> now look, look how it's now descending wow. down. It's now moving down to the tree level. Um, let's just go back a bit so you can see that. In, it's descending downwards. Um, so it's now going behind the tree. Mm. And I do urge any listeners out there to look at this footage. It's on the mm. Haunted Devon Facebook page. Go to last week's um, advert for, for the show and you can see the footage. The total footage lasts for just over four minutes. Um, it's extraordinary footage and there it completely goes out of view because it goes down beyond the horizon. <laughs> So what was your reaction to that scene for the well, first I'm, time? I'm completely baffled. I have got nothing to say. I don't know what on earth. I mean, if I was going to see an a UFO, it wouldn't look like that. I have, I have this no is idea. the beauty of UFOs. They can come in all different shapes and sizes, you know. And they, you can get they the can classic change. design of flying saucer, yeah, but the, they can come in triangular, They can get the ones that change oval. shape as well, that they are very that are getting into fluid. Different yeah. shapes. They can become fluid. Jellyfish, huge pulsating red jellyfish, colossal, are seen you know, up in the sky. They are all part of the UFO phenomena. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Um, yeah, so Dave Gillum was going to keep me informed once he's interviewed the guy with this footage. Um, he's going to set up the interview. Um, at the moment, that's yet to happen. Mm. So um, fingers crossed, it all goes ahead and... It will happen. But yeah, that footage, I don't know if you, um, oh, I'm sure you can remember in much more detail than I can, Martin, <laughs> is the uh, the ghost rockets. Yes, well, ghost rockets. They, they, were, they were dubbed the, the, the ghost rockets, but uh, with, with the Air, Air Force pilots that were flying, it actually drew that... Yes, that, that, that kind that of, kind of, of cl yeah, It, it exactly. looks very, very reminiscent it, of that. It does, yeah. And it's the beauty of UFOs. They can just take on all manner of different types of shapes. Mm. And as you said, they can actually morph. And I actually witnessed that myself with my ex-wife coming back from Cardiff. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself. I've mentioned this on a previous <laughs> show. But for Sue's sake, two black triangles, Sunday afternoon, suspended it over the River Avon. They then turned into two huge black slits of light either side. The, the whole sighting lasted for about 10 minutes as we was going down the M5 heading back to Devon. And then they turned into two huge plumes of smoke with a definite cut-off point at the top and the bottom. Then the two plumes of smoke merged together to make one big huge column of smoke. It then turned into a greyish colour and then it expanded out, puffed out in the middle to make one huge cloud. Wow. And that was how the sighting ended. As just one huge cloud, wow. and that was it. That was the sighting. Again, with the sighting that I had with the children at work uh, back before Christmas, with the the magic rocket or the magic plane they called it, because it kept appearing and then disappearing. That again took on a, a, a almost like a mercury a fluid, liquid metal type. To it. Yeah. 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 I'd like to ask you a question, Martin. Then, so, what do you think about? What do you feel? Why don't they do more than just appear and then disappear? Mm. We've only got ten minutes to go, so I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> oh, <come laughs> That's a cop out, Martin. Yeah. You, we, 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 can, we can put you on high speed. You might sound like a chipmunk, but you'll get it all in. Well, I'll put this as briefly as I can <laughs> to awaken our human consciousness. Brilliant. Oh, will that? Will that do? That, 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 I want to keep on. it as simple that, as that, I can. That, 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 I can so talk do. until two o'clock in the morning just on this, but to keep it as simple as I can, reawaken. Or subconscious minds again with yeah. crop circles. The crop circles yeah. are doing that on a deep mm. subconscious so level. Whichever bit of the tree you're on, or whichever edge of the circle, look, we're getting closer, aren't we? Definitely. So UFOs or whatever it is. Uh, paranormal um, activity is on an increase. Uh, we know that, was, especially uh, poltergeist activity. We know that that's definitely on an increase. Astral travel. Astral travel healing. We were before oof. the show, so so that um, astral. Travel is actually on the increase you're yes. finding. So that's mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yes. Talk about that. Well, I it's only I mean I've been interested in astral travel for ages and the work of Robert Monroe. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Mm. He was an extraordinary man. And he started the Monroe Institute and the Gateway Experience where he 
uh, created binaural sound for people, which creates a gateway once the two hemispheres of the brain are in synchrony. It provides a doorway to go out and explore the different dimensions. Now, I've never been there myself, so I'm not speaking from my own experience, but I know a lot of people, more people, who are talking about projecting. Um, and the other night, I got up in the middle of the night and I went down into my office and I had put my hand on a book and it was Blow Me Down, Astral Dynamics by a man called Robert Bruce who's been teaching people to do this for years. Wow. He lives in Australia and mm. it's like the handbook for how to get out of your body. And what, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to borrow that one <laughs> off you too because I'm having right trouble. It's, uh, it's, it's, mm, there's nothing flaky about what yeah. he's writing. This is it. This is what's going on. And he says it. You know, when you actually go out for the first time, it's quite a shock. Mm. And, of course, you come in contact with the astral level, astral plane, which is just like the World Wide Web. You don't want to hang around there too long. You no. want to, like the Egyptians, keep your eye on the fixed circumpolar star, go through the astral, like the asteroid belt, go through it, because there's much more interesting things beyond it. But you can get entranced in the astral plane. <laughs> but that's where you start. So, so it's still important to keep yourself grounded. <laughs> It's your intention always, Martin. It's your I intention is everything. It's like an arrow. So if you set your intention that you want the highest experience, that you don't want to muck about, um, that's what you'll get. Mm. And it's like it is like quantum. It's um, I did a very interesting course on uh, the physics of miracles, and Richard Bartlett, who teaches that, he talks about the two pointed. So when you think, you don't have to worry about the map to get there. You just think there, and you are there. Mm. So you create here and there, just like two quantum particles. Whoosh, it's instead of being in uh, space time, you you flip it into time yeah. space. Mm. So, so it's you want, yeah. You want to answer a quest. You want a question. Mm. You you formulate the question. Where is such and such? Psh, there you are. Mm. Of course, wow. talking about that kind of thing, but we all know Edgar Casey could do this at will Absolutely. himself, couldn't he? Mm. Fantastic book. One of my all-time favourite paranormal books. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Is uh, there is a river? Yeah, um, I've never read that. R fantastic book. It looks at the life history of Edgar Casey, yeah. um, written by his best friend, and it looks at how he set up the institution yeah. and how he helped people throughout the 1940s it did, it in, yeah. through hypnotic regression. Yeah. And they, they actually, it was a group of scientists that was testing him under laboratory conditions thinking, of course, that they can completely disprove everything he comes out with. And what a load of nonsense this guy must be coming out with. But under laboratory conditions in front of these scientists, he completely dumbfounded them. Yeah. It's all explained in the book, There mm. is a River. I hear Jenny listener right there. Is, out of the thousands of paranormal books I've read, this is one of my all-time favourites. Yeah. I think he was extraordinary because he was a man who didn't believe... He was a Baptist, wasn't he? He That's didn't right, believe yeah. in reincarnation, but he talked about people's past lives and was absolutely horrified. He would go he in said. this out-of-body yeah. state which he yeah, could bring sure. about by will and he could actually look back into people's past yeah. lives and, and unblock the problem that they're experiencing mm -hmm. now in, the pr in their present life. And this was during the 1940s and 1950s. Wow. Yeah. I wonder why, he, I mean, 13, about some 13,000 or 1,300 of his readings involved Egypt, didn't they, and the Hall of Records? That's right, mm. yes. And that it would be found somewhere in the, right. on the plateau. It hasn't arrived, has it, yet? Well, uh, this you, is it. You can't dig under the Sphinx. They, 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 not, they don't want the you to do it, do they? No, but the gentleman's been removed. As important as this, mm. if it was to happen... This is something that they would cover up, isn't it? This is well, something yeah. that they will not allow out to the media. No. This is something that might have already been discovered. And it's all I been mean, kept they, top secret. They had this, um, oh, I can't remember what program, my memory, sometimes I have the most amazing memory and other times it fails me miserably. <laughs> I was watching this program um, on ancient Egypt and they'd made this amazing discovery and I can't remember where it was now. And it was just as the riots started to happen back in uh, 2000, January 2011, uh, 2010 or 2000, 2011. And um, they went away at the end of the season and they came back and all of a sudden there was a graveyard over it. So they could not access what they wanted to find. But it was um, a very historical importance that would have pretty much bowled over Egypt Egyptology as we know it. But... They couldn't well, do I anything. Think that's the same. I mean, the Sphinx enclosure, you can't go in there without a permit. No. And you can't go there without a permit from Zahir Was. Well, Zahir Was has been, I think it's been, I don't think he's been completely removed, but 
there's already ground seeking radar has discovered that there is an anomaly there mm. of course nobody's I mean what he's been doing on the Giza plateau is anybody's anyone's guess because he doesn't allow anybody else to know. no but again he is the uh, the stooge to keep these secrets away from the public absolutely he's a guardian mm. I mean that whole fuss about the which again would be the the, the 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 higher secret <laughs> societies who are privy to this knowledge, who are pri who are privy to the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and their teachings, they don't want us to have this knowledge because we will realise our full potential. We all understand the meaning. Of and reincarnation, if so if if we if we understand our real potential, then they have no power. Yeah, it takes away their power because yeah. it means we are in control of yeah, destiny. Absolutely. Materialistic things suddenly <laughs> become. Uh, non-existent to us because we realise that we incarnate mm. to many different dimensions. And again, this is something that they just do not want us to know about. It's uh, like What's a, a payoff. That's what I always wonder. What is a payoff for that? I mean, what are you going to do with a world inhabited by robots? Then what? What is the payoff? Oh, again, we again we've only got five, five minutes. Go into this, <laughs> <have> we? <laughs> we're, we're nice big en energy drains. We're we're good little. Uh, Little fuel cells, can we say? Is, is probably yeah. the simplest way to, uh, yeah, <laughs> with the matrix going on there. Um, but yeah, uh, just before we go, a uh, conversation that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, as we're talking about past lives, um, someone that's hopefully uh, going to be coming into Egypt with us um, or Easter Island, depending on political situations. You were saying not only could they travel to their past lives, but they could also travel to their future, future lives as well. Mm. That's what the work that I'm doing at the moment. I can you can actually do it. Past lives, future consciousness. Remember your eternal self is what I call it. Mm. So it's just going into different time zones. It's I mean it's uh, it feels like a preparation, preparatory for doing something, the next leap. Yeah. Because when you realise how easy I mean I couldn't that wouldn't have happened, six years ago people wouldn't get it but no. they do. I mean I don't do anything except set it up and then off they off go. They go. Mm. Like I just, it's just amazing what is now actually mm. accessible to us via our own consciousness, what we can accept now. There's a G camp open. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I mean, if you had any advice uh, to give to people in this energy right now, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Be yourself. Be. That's good advice. Mm. <laughs> We've covered some very deep-rooted subjects have. tonight. We have. We? <laughs> I mean, I must admit, people worry, especially last year. Um, oh, no, 2012, the world's going to end. 2013, what's it going to hold? The stock market, this, that and the other. Um, what I'd say to people is, I said, be yourself. Live in the now. Live in the right now. Not just, oh, I've got to go to work tomorrow. And, oh, I've got to pay the bills. But what you're... What your soul, what your inner self is telling you what you want right now with instincts. Do I want to be out with nature? Do I want to go and find out more about this? Do I want to do that? Do I want to that? Just listen to that inner voice within yourself and... Ask yourself always, is this true? That's the one. <laughs> because that's a way of unravelling and unpacking your onion skins. Mm. Uh, and Because we are absolutely uh, carapace, if that's the right word, it by our belief system, our bio, well, the biology of beliefs, another wonderful book, you know, that we are what we believe we are. And it's being yourself. And the more weird you are, the more eccentric you are, bring it on. Because we are not supposed to be the same as each other. No. We are all unique, as our thumbprint and our DNA is. So express yourself. Mm. I mean, I must admit, I'd rather be abnormal in a world such as abnormal. this, then, yeah, abnormal. <laughs> Abby, unnormal. <laughs> it's, what, it's, what my, it's what my brother and sister call me, funnily enough, is abnormal. <laughs> I'd rather be abnormal in a world this crazy than be normal. Oh, Most definitely. Normal. No. We don't want to do normal. No, normal's not good. Not encouraging anarchy. It's just, in, it's individual. Encouraging self-expression and imagination and creativity. Yes, yes with respect. Yeah. For everyone else. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming in tonight, Sue. Pleasure. Thank you. It's been um, fascinating. It has been. Um, we've run out of time yet again, unfortunately. <laughs> we we need we need longer. <laughs> We're going to 
to push the two hour mark. Oh, oh my word. word. After Easter Island, yeah. we'd be amazed even further. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, if Wiltshire was said anything to go by last year and that was. Blah! <laughs> Again, is all I've got for that one. Yeah. Um, I listened to the show. I emailed you, didn't I, last week? I listened to the show. I was feeling a bit down, so I thought, I oh, know, I'll go back and I'll listen to the Wiltshire show afterwards. I was so uplifted and so amazed because it brought it all back to me what actually happened over those two, two and a half, three days. Yeah, it's the first time that I have listened back to that show was last week um, since we actually broadcast that back in August. It sounds and so unbelievable, though, if you actually sit and back listen to it. Now, to it. It's a two-hour radio show that we did, just me and Abby mm. discussing the events of what unfolded in Wiltshire that weekend. It and sounds totally... It does sound completely and utterly ludicrous. preposterous. It, it really, really does. does. But this, these... Mm. These things happen to us, you know. This is, the trouble. Yeah, this is it, isn't it? It's it? It honestly sounds like a good bit of radio. Oh, we went to Wiltshire, nothing really happened, but we've got a great radio show on it. But no, it was literally every, what everything we said, we said on that show is true. happened, you know. Amazing, and that's amazing. And uh, go, going back and listening to it, my brain was just fried. <laughs> It's like uh, it's almost been a year now. My brain's still I fried. Can I go through it again? Yeah, that was something we'll that we'll just never forget. That one there and then move to the next one. That's, that's it. it. That's yeah. definitely. I mean, when we go in this year, we're not expecting anything, are we? No, we've got to go in not expecting anything. Not expecting to anything. That's to pretty happen. much what we did last summer, wasn't it? We didn't go with any expectations. No such. expectations. And all these things just no, unfolded. No, in no, front no of us. Um, pre-existing. Yeah. Anything like that, and it was just yeah. I <laughs> I went in like you told me to go into Egypt. No preconceptions, yeah, no blank mind, yeah. and, and off you go. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, for this week's show. Next week, we have uh, Bob Mann coming into the studio, a local author from uh, Totnes, and he is going to be talking to us about his new book, All About Berry Pomeroy Castle. I know it's a place that has intrigued me ever since I was a little girl, and... Um, would be a place I'd love to investigate, but unfortunately that is uh, not open to the public for investigations. It used to be, because I know Haunted Devon did do a couple of investigations. Years ago. In the early years. I went on one of them. Uh, you went to Barry Pomeroy yeah, on investigation? I actually went on one, um, an unofficial one back in the mid-1990s. Um, which was quite interesting. It's just the atmosphere of the place. It's only a few miles away from this very street. It is, yes. It is only. I've got, I've got to drive past it to get home. Of course. Yeah. I do have to drive past <laughs> it to get home. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it is a place that's always fascinated mm. me. It's a place of a lot of energy. Not all, not all good, I might add. Mm. The, there has been a, a hell of a lot of... A very rich atmosphere there. Even if you go there in the daytime, you can sense a very rich atmosphere. It's just dense. Yeah. Atmosphere. I mean, I've had a lot. I know people have had experiences. I know I've had a lot of experiences there just in the daytime, let mm. alone going at night but um mm. yes mm. it is it is a spooky it's not for the faint-hearted yeah. uh, is barry pomeroy yeah. it is definitely not for the faint-hearted we'll look forward to that show yes yes <laughs> look forward to that show maybe finding out a bit more uh, about the mystery of the place because uh, i know bob has gone quite deep um is also in, in in legend as well as history and maybe we can find a bit of a middle ground and uh, see what makes barry pomeroy such a an energetic place Mm. <laughs> and uh, so it's good night from me. Good night from me. And thank you. Good night from me. See you next you week. Sir.